There we go. We are live. So let's let, uh, give a few few minutes to, to have everyone join. I'm going to send out a retweet, and then we can start going. Okay, it looks like we have the um, – Looks like we have building on Ethereum now streaming on Twitter. So we're good. And I will jump to the comments. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, so we have about 45 people in here so far. We'll give it another couple of minutes. So, yeah, man, how's everything been going with you this week? You've been having a good month. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've just been building a lot of stuff, right? Uh, Ethereum is is getting more and more adoption and attraction. And uh, as a builder, that's really excited. It's exciting because I, I think like one of the things that I love the most is when people use the things I've built and I, we've, we're just getting more and more users and people are wanting to experiment more with Ethereum. And so as a builder, I want to create as many kind of things for other builders to pull off the shelf and, and create products and things to, to engage people. So we're, and we're here to learn about a building on Ethereum and it's Bowtie Friday. So I'm, I'm excited. This is great. Thanks for having me. You're, uh, you're, you're muted. Careful. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry about that. I'm updating our banner oh, to good. kind of, um, oh, there it is. Have our names oh. on there. Oh, cool. And I got a little icon too. Check that. Wait, where is it right here? Ooh, nice icon. There we go. Okay, cool. So we can go ahead and get started, man. Um, we have about an hour and I kind of reached out to you because I'm a big fan of yours because I kind of, I'm a web developer that's never really been in this space. I've been building on React, React Native, front-end stuff, got into serverless, got into cloud a few years ago and really been focusing on that and recently became really, really fascinated with uh, Web3 and I became fascinated with uh, TFI and a lot of the stuff that's happening and some of the ideas around building out these different protocols and stuff like that that are governing governed by um, smart contracts and, and also the decentralized protocols. And I think when I started diving into it, one of the names that kept coming up was Austin Griffith. So I figured this would be a great opportunity for me to sit down with you and then in the future, some other people from this space and just chat about you know, how to kind of get into it, how to start building as a developer, as a traditional web developer too, because I think that there's a huge opportunity for overlap from the traditional web space, the React developers, the Vue developers, the serverless, and all of these developers to kind of start building in this area. And, and there is a lot less overlap than I kind of expected when I started like diving into it. There's kind of like two separate communities that are somewhat siloed off from each other, you know? I think so uh, before I kind of lean into, we should, we yeah. should think of the, the theme here is getting a web two developer on board with web three. I like that a lot. So can you kind of give an intro to yourself and how you, uh, you know, how your career has progressed and how you got into this space? So, yeah, I got into the space uh, like late 2017. I was building just like fell in love with Ethereum, went down the rabbit hole, started building anything I could figure out. Uh, I, it kind of like became more like games. I built Galliass.io, which is uh, I don't know. Where does this go when I, oh, no, that's just private chat to you, darn it. <laughs> it it's like a game on chain uh, with with ERC-721s and ERC-20s and like markets. And it's it's kind of this fun game where you kind of play online on a side chain. And uh, it's all hand painted, like the graphics. It's, it's supposed to look like a big painting that sort of moves as uh, every block on XDAI gets mined. You see all the ships move. So I got in, I built games. I don't think anybody really cared. There, there weren't a lot of uh, users going back to like getting users in your game. Now you can get in and you can see, uh, you can see Galliast.io and you can see all the little ships there. But uh, there, there weren't very many users, and so I started experimenting with maybe like tools. Like what? Okay, so I've built something and it's okay, but no one really cares. What do people care about? And I started building more tools and more tutorials and explaining the process of how I was building things. And that got traction and people were really interested in, oh, like what, you know, what's this dude doing over here and, and seeing the tools and seeing the stuff I was building. Uh, I did like a deep dive and showed off meta transactions and showed how you can sign messages with one account that doesn't have any ETH and then have another account kind of relay that on chain. And that helps with a lot of your user experience. Your users don't have to be immediately onboarded. They can kind of sign messages. And uh, then, then uh, Burner Wallet, right? Burner Wallet was another thing that I created that was like, uh, just like it, it already existed, but it was about making it more obvious and making people use it. 
And Burner Wall is just like taking a private key, putting it in a local storage, giving someone that instant access to the key pair, to signing transactions, to be able to send things quickly over like a phone. And we use the Burner Wall at Adeep Denver. And then uh, kind of moving over toward, I started working on ETH.build. So ETH build is like a, a place to tinker with Web3. You can kind of drag in these components and wire them up. And then uh, after that, it was Scaffold ETH. Uh, a kind of a freestanding, a full dApp. It's a full dApp with all the state-of-the-art tools that gets you straight into working on your Solidity and tinkering with Solidity and learning that first. And then you can kind of make small changes and the app stays up and you can kind of learn by kind of tinkering with something that already exists. So that's kind of the whole the whole spectrum of, yeah, yeah. of my tour of duty so far. Sorry for the long intro. So before you got into <laughs> Ethereum like and in, in, in dApp development, what were you doing before that? I was I was doing like DevOps and I was doing uh, just like building web apps and building with Docker and containers and backends and stuff like that. So and what year did you kind of start too. getting into this space? Probably like two, 2017. I'm not I'm not nearly as OG as most of these guys. Like I, I'm a middle, that's pretty OG. Middle. I mean, <laughs> like in the context of how fast things are moving and how how many developers have been onboarded into this ecosystem just in the last year or so, including myself. Um, like I guess so you you kind of got into it around 2017 and like there was a big you know uh, bull a bull cycle I guess you would say right like a, a lot of people yep. were getting excited about it and then there was another like couple of years 2018 was kind of like a down year but you stuck you stayed with it because you kind of were bought into the whole idea and, and you were kind of sold I guess right. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it was sort of like I bought my first ETH at like four hundred dollars and I could have purchased $400 ETH like probably nine months ago or something. So there was a long time within the space. Right, where nothing was, was like, happening. How, well, was, how we was that? Was it hard to like, things. yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, okay, you're right, exactly. There was a lot of things happening actually, um, especially now that I'm kind of getting into this space, I'm seeing all the work that's been done. But I mean, in the sense of like hype cycle, the hype cycle was kind of over and um, there was a lot of people doing interesting stuff. How was that experience over those those years? Uh, it's it's cool. It, it was a little more raw, right? Like when we were trying to when we we're trying to figure out how to fund developers, when we we're trying to figure out how to keep developers in the space, it's a lot harder in a bear market. And things like Gitcoin grants helped out a lot. Like people survived on those grants, and so there was there was definitely like an ICO craze, and uh, probably a small set of people got really rich. But in general, the builders, I think. Yeah, the, the builders had to stick it out through a bear market and that uh, that was tough for just keeping people around. But in, in a bull market, it's a lot easier because we can be like, here's a grant, here's a grant, here's a grant, right? But in, in the bear market, it was harder and it kind of, that that sort of works as a whetstone that sharpens this, the blade and makes, makes sure that we're doing things very efficiently and building things. And uh, it also shows like, who sticks around in those markets are are probably like the 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 good the good builders you want to keep around too. So as far as kind of like how the current market is today and and, and the amount of interest in people building, um, like what are some ways that people can start learning about Ethereum and, and making money one day and becoming like a DApp developer? I mean, from what I've seen coming into this area, like I, I was in cloud computing, you know, for a long time and the market is just absolutely, you know, wild right now there. There's so many people hiring. There's so many job opportunities, so much money to be made as a consultant. I thought that that was kind of like, you know, it's, it's really wild as it could get until I kind of got into this space and I'm starting to see it's almost even wilder. Um, I mean, I hear about some of the people that are doing the Solidity smart contract um, auditing. They're making like hundreds of thousands of dollars um, and there's not enough of them even close to, to even find enough people. You have to book them out months in advance. Um, I know that like blockchain developers building on Ethereum are like averaging in the 150K range regardless of their location. Um, so how do people you know, start getting into this and, and, and getting their first opportunity? So, yeah, first of all, that's like a problem. Like that's bad that it's that expensive to get an audit. Like we, we need more developers. And I think that's what you're leaning into is like, hey, Web2 guys, get in here. There's there's money to be made. But all, like as an ecosystem, we need to do better at having a more uh, accessible audits. But let's throw that aside and talk about like how, how do we get in and what, what where do we get started? So first of all, like just ethereum.org, right? Ethereum.org is a great starting point. You're, you're going to have 
a ton of content there that they've been doing a good job of keeping up. If you have questions, if you're looking for certain things, certain tools, different uh, uh, tracks, right? It's kind of a choose your own adventure. Go to ethereum.org and get into the content. There's there's so much content deep, deeply, deeply nested into ethereum.org. So that's a great place to start. The second place, it like straight up, if you are a developer, a Web2 developer, like I will shield you very hard on starting with Scaffold E. It's 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 the repo that I have put together that has all the state of the art tools that has hundreds of different branches of of different uh, mechanisms and tutorials and different things and and uh, when you're ready for it I'd like to share my screen and just take you through the uh, introduction of Scaffold E because I think it's so important to kind of like solidify and 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 also to step into that like solidity by example is really good just like. RTFM, right? Like read, read the manual. If, if you go look at Solidity by example in the Solidity docs, you're going to see examples of what smart contracts look like and, and it's going to click right away for a, a good developer. Yeah, I agree. I think Solidity by example is a super really good place to start. And I think the Ethereum docs and and all, all the stuff that you mentioned is really great. And um, Solidity docs, Ethereum docs would be the two places I would start. Scaffold ETH. Um, yeah, so feel free to go ahead and, and show, us, show us some code. Awesome. So I'm going to share my screen. I think, oh, look at that. You, you are a StreamYard master. Okay. Awesome. So let's, uh, so Scaffold ETH, basically, if you just Google Scaffold ETH, you're going to land on the repo. Uh, the quick start is probably, if you want, there's a nice little video that shows an intro, but uh, let's just get into it. I've already done the Yarn install. But uh, let's do a yarn start. So it is a little bit like launching a rocket. You're going to need to bring up a few services. Uh, the first thing we'll do is bring up our back end, right? So this is our, our, our front end. I'm sorry, kind of going in, in backwards order. But we're going to bring up our React app uh, first. And then uh, we're going to do a yarn chain. So that's going to bring up our hard hat node. So we'll have a local blockchain with a bunch of accounts loaded up with a bunch of ETH. Then we'll have a React server kind of serving up the front end. And so what we'll want to do is let's get in and look at this code real quick while this while this front end is coming up. I wish I could zoom this a little bit bigger, but uh, I, I don't think I can zoom this area, but I know I can zoom this area. Okay, so what I do is I start you out with this just like a very simple boilerplate contract where we have some string purpose that we're tracking and, and there's a function that you can set the purpose. And uh, this will yarn deploy is our third action here and this is going to get us set up all the way to the front end once once this dev server comes up uh we will have an app so uh there it is okay so we've got our solidity and then we've got our front end right next to it and this is kind of the key dev loop here to be able to let's just redeploy i'm just going to read uh, yeah, i'm going to disconnect my metamask too okay so here we go so we've got our smart contract here and we've got our front end here and we can just redeploy anytime we want the new smart contract and you'll see this address uh, auto reload with the new contract. So now we're like ready. We're like in Solidity tinkering mode, right? So let's grab Solidity, uh, read the docs is a great place and also Solidity by example, right? And then let's just go learn something like, like we can look at our premise. We're, we're a good programmer. We get, okay, there's bools. What are the primitives? What are, what's going on here? We have uint eights. We've got addresses. Let me just grab one of these uint eights mm -hmm. to show what happens when we bring it in here. So let's grab a uint eight. We'll, we'll make it public. We'll call it counter and we'll set it equal to one and we'll do a deploy. So we've added some more solidity and now we should see that show up uh, kind of auto adapt in our front end. So our front end is going to notice that we've added this new variable and it's going to display it for us. So it gives us this feedback loop where we can dive in and kind of like really get going. I feel like maybe we should introduce the mental model a little bit. You talked about backends and you talked about being a web two engineer and having it mm -hmm. kind of be different as web three. Uh, if, if you want to, you can kind of think about Ethereum like a very expensive asynchronous database. <laughs> what, what we have is kind of this storage layer and we're able to read from it. But if we want to write to it, so we, we've got to grab funds from the faucet. But if we want to actually write to it, we can whoops, we can make a transaction and that transaction has to get mined into a block. We have to pay gas. Uh, but then when we update that value, it's not like we update it in one little database somewhere right? When we think of what it looks like, there's this whole substrate, there's this whole like thousands, tens of thousands of nodes, right? Probably like 10,000 nodes all across the network. 
And when we update that value in that smart contract, everyone has a copy of that smart contract and they all have to update that value. And that's kind of like the aha here of like what that thing looks like and mm -hmm. why it's so expensive, but also why it's so powerful. There's no central entity. It's coming to consensus over things and you're able to store and you're able to do storage and execution on that substrate. So if you kind of think of the mental model more like it's kind of like an embedded controller or like a punch card. It's a very simple little computer that you can program, but that simple little computer lives across, uh, is duplicated and is coming to consensus across like 10,000 different nodes. So it's a very expensive, censorship resistant, trustless database. Can we call it that and just think of it as our storage layer? And it's just really expensive to talk to. Is that, is that? A yeah. Yeah. Analogy? I think this was like the, I think so. this is the tough part for me because what I'm used to, and I think like the paradigm itself has a few other pieces that we're, we we may or may not be able to kind of get into. But when you think of like the, the average application that, that I write, I might be creating like a chat application where I'm updating millions of values in a database over the course of a, uh, a, a month or something like that, like for, say for a messaging app. Um, you can't actually probably consider building that type of data uh, being written onto a blockchain. I think that smart contracts fit in in a way that for me was really hard to understand looking at it from that perspective. But I think like when you start diving into the the idea of Web3 and some of the other tools that are out there and how smart contracts fit into that, it's like a small piece, but it's also a very large piece. But it's not, you're not going to look at using it the same way that you would a high input output database. When you read from a contract though, it's free, right? So like you can read a million um, requests a second or however many you need, it's always going to be free. The writing is what know. costs money. Right. And then, and typically like these high, high, high throughput write operations are going to be sent to a peer-to-peer -peer database that is not uh, a blockchain um, for the most part, which I don't know if we're going to be able to kind of get into that, but that's a different, a different part of the stack, I would say. Yep. Yeah. Going back to just that, that database that we're thinking of, it's very asynchronous. You sort of fire a write off and it goes out into the mid mempool and you have no guarantees about when that's going to happen, depending on how your gas prices are and what's going on on the network. So you could send that transaction to do a write and it could happen eight blocks later or never. And so, so it's very asynchronous. You fire off the write and you kind of wait for it to happen, but you're right. Reads, reads can happen instantly from anywhere and you can get that from anywhere in the network. And if part of the network is stamped out, you can read that from any other part and it's very like peer to peer, but you said you were talking about high latency stuff. I think that like when we think of high latency stuff, we think about games and so, sort of some of that. You you have to be very careful with ga games. Work a different way it, on on chain, right? So going going back to Galias, it, we might as well just pull it up. I've, I've talked about it enough that I should I should show it off since I have a screen share. So when when you're building a game on Ethereum, you're not going to have movement built right into the smart contract, right? You're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to say, is this person standing on the lever right now? And then they move, they move in a high frequency way, they move left and right and left and right and jump on something, right? Like that's just not gonna go on chain. So you have to come up with other tricks. And here's here's one trick that I came up with. So so that I've got my ship here and he's anchored, but I can send a transaction to put the sails up. So I just sent one transaction and now my sails are up. So, so one, set, one transaction to put the sails up, and then the ship will sail on its own with each block that is mined. So I kind of had to just change my mental model for what I'm storing and how I know. And I still know where this ship is because I know what block the, the, uh, the transaction was to put up my sails, and I know how fast this thing moves. So I know where he, he'll be throughout the journey, de depending on how many blocks get mined. But I had to think about what goes on chain and what doesn't go on chain. Does that make sense? There we go. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Awesome. All right. So uh, I, if you notice, I don't know if you noticed, but I put, uh, I made a small change while you were talking and I kind of added a, a counter, right? We had this UN8 counter. I'm just going to redeploy it at five. So going back to this mental model of this is a super expensive embedded controller uh, that's replicated everywhere, thinking about just having like this one piece of memory that's holding eight bits to, to keep track of a counter. And then we have these functions where we can increment and decrement, right? So, so that shows up over here and I've got my counter and I can hit the increment button and we see it goes up to six and I can decrement down to five, right? But this is, this is what, something I always like to show people is what happens when we get down to zero and we decrement one more time, 
ooh, we get underflow, right? We only had eight bits there. It's a UN8. So we only had eight bits to track that. And it was all zero. And we subtracted one from that. And there was no checking for underflow. So you kind of have to just be cognizant of what's going on with those bits underneath there and understand that underflow is possible. Let's see. Um, someone asked a question. Yeah. Is crypto dev market open to hiring self-taught devs without CS degrees? <laughs> of course. Yeah. It's, it's funny. That's like... Of course, <laughs> right? You're, you're. Yeah, you're... I think I think it's more so in this industry, in this in this area, this ecosystem than any other one that I've ever been in. And the reason is that it's so small compared to like the traditional web ecosystem. But there's so much more demand that that people are literally just hiring anyone that that they can get, and they don't really care about anything other than can you can you actually like accomplish this thing cool and can stuff. you learn quickly exactly. and like are you a, a good communicator all the the things that you would kind of be hard for for a regular job but it's all about the performance and like can you do this thing we don't really care about credentials like at all and, the best <laughs> and in fact there's it? a lot of developers from like develop you know d other countries like outside the united states or, or eastern or uh, central western europe so a lot of developers from south america a lot of developers from africa a lot of developers from asia that are kind of um you know, just jumping into this, it seems like. And, and speaking even more to that, a great way to do it is to go do it. Like, you don't need a piece of paper to prove anything. There's a poll, rec there's a there's an issue on a on a repo of any of the hundreds of different companies within Ethereum. There's issues in their repo. You get in there, you tackle an issue, you put in a PR, they're going to notice. And and if you do a good job and you work on those things, the, the space is going to pick you up pretty quickly. Uh, I, th I still think we can do a better job of, since the mental model is so hard to get up, like there's there's like a, there's a big curve to really get an understanding of things. And then there's almost mm -hmm. like a tour of duty to understand like market fit. So it's not just the technicality. It's like, it's like, all the different applications and product market fit. And so it's almost like getting into the space, we almost should be rewarding just like scholarships to people who are trying <laughs> at first. And then later on, look at like, okay, like now you've gotten over the mental model. You get why that cool thing you built, no one cared about. Let's move on to something that someone will care about, right? Go going back to me being in the dark, building these things that no one cares about. It's way better to build in public, open source, show everything off, get feedback and see what resonates with with your you know possible new users. So let's see. Uh, I've got a purpose here and I wanted to dive in a little bit more to just like tinkering with solidity. We just we just tinkered a little bit there with with a UN8, right? We kind of looked at primitive and data primitives and data types. We pulled in a UN8. I think I want to pull in an address here and just kind of show that off too. So Again, think of this like a like a very like an embedded controller. We're we're writing in in this very intricate language, which Solidity is actually very simple. It's very simple to write this stuff. But I'm going to grab uh, my front end user here, this D7B, and I'm going to set them as we're just going to track something. We're going to call it the owner, right? I'm going to put that into my code, and I'm going to deploy that. So now my contract is keeping track of a specific address that is our owner. And now this is like a really powerful thing. So, so Bitcoin gave us like decentralization in a way. Ethereum lets us build on top of that decentralization. So you as a developer, your mental model is like, this is an exp expensive trustless database, but it's really easy for you to build new mechanics and build rules on top of that. And that's what I want to show here. So let's see, did our contract get deployed? Oh, wait, I didn't make it public, darn it. Okay, so we've got our public owner, and when I deploy that, it's going to show up as the owner. But writing rules are really important. Let me just get in here and write the first rule, super simple solidity. You've probably all seen it before, but it's good to kind of go through the mental model. So we're going to require that the message.sender equals our owner, or we're going to say not the owner. So we're writing a rule in here, and we're saying, hey, you can't get past this point if you're not the owner. And so let's go ahead and deploy that. So, yep, it's got us tracked as the owner. So now we're going to try to set the purpose, make sure we can do it as the owner. And we should be able to. Here we go. Hello, world. This should work, right? But now let me bring up an incognito window. And let me go to localhost from that. And let's see it show up. And let's even let's even copy copy some funds and send it. Oops, let's copy its address and send it some money. So it has some money from the faucet. 
or or from us even okay so they should have some funds now now if they try to set the purpose we should have a rule there that says ah not the owner awesome so we were able to create a second account test the fact that that require statement works but the key is you as the builder can program in those rules and you can program those rules really easy. Like this language is pretty simple and straightforward. It's all the other code you have to write around it to make a good product. But this is kind of like your database. This is your storage layer, very expensive storage layer. This isn't very interesting though. This is pretty centralized. This is basically like an attestation smart contract. We're set up so me and only me can get in. I can only I can get in here and change this. Let's make one small change. We're going to make this function payable and we're going to allow anyone to get in, but we're going to make sure that they send at least uh, some amount, some small amount of ether, maybe 0 0.001 ether. And we'll say not enough. So we've just slightly modified our smart contract. Instead of writing a rule that they have to be someone, we're writing a rule that they have to send in some money. And now our smart contract should change and our set purpose function is gonna change a little bit and it's gonna give us a little input box. But now anyone in the world, let's say, let's go back to, to this random dude over here, kind of kind of this random bad guy, green, green guy. Now he can say hello world and he can set this purpose. But if he doesn't send in any money, he's going to get in trouble. It's going to say not enough. But if he pays for it, if he's willing to pay for it, and we're going to take it times 10 to the 18, we'll talk about that in a second, and we pay for it, there we go. He's allowed to pay for it. And something really neat happens, this smart contract now has money in it. So, so instead of thinking of this as like an attestation where one thing can get in, we changed one small line of solidity, and we made it more like a vending machine. We deploy this thing, we deploy the app, and now anyone can get in here and pay money to set the purpose. Now we could maybe make it a little bit more expensive. We could maybe make the price go up as each person puts in money. But you can kind of get the feel for what it's like to be kind of thinking about building on Ethereum and what that mental model looks like. And I, it's almost like it's the greatest massive multiplayer RPG ever built for developers. It's like this substrate of building apps, uh, decentralized apps, and on top of that, we can really easy, easily script these fun new mechanics in. And with Scaffold ETH, there's kind of like the app is all ready for you. You just kind of get in and put those mechanics in and then deploy your app. We, I, should, I should stop mansplaining for a second if you want to jump in here. Uh, no, no, this what, is all... What's next? What do you think? No, this is all super interesting. I mean, I think that like the fundamental stack is just so much different than what I'm used to that I think when I started kind of learning all this stuff, I just had to kind of unlearn a lot of the things that I was used to doing. Well, so let's 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 kind of like speak to what I just said actually a little bit and kind of talk about what are these fundamental differences. And I think you talked about one already is the, how, you, how you treat uh, Ethereum as a database is a lot different than we might treat a typical database. And it kind of serves certain purposes. It is much better and has adds a lot more enhanced features versus something that we might um, be used to typically using and it has its trade-offs as well. But I think the interesting thing to me is identity and how we think about identity in the web two world versus kind of how we think about identity and adapt. So for instance, one of the big deals and one of the things I'm actually really interested in, I'm actually writing a big a blog post that's going to be out on uh, free code camp about like what is web three and uh, how decentralization you know, works today and kind of the whole, the idea around and, and all, all of the different uh, trade-offs and the vision of Web3, like what is that? And I think one of the big things to me is is how identity works today versus how it will work in the future. So for instance, if I sign up for an app, I'm handing over an OAuth uh, often that gives the company my, my name, my email address, my phone number, all of this personal information. And then they start tying all of my all of my interactions to my personal information. So they have all this data on me. They're storing it. Sometimes the data gets leaked. Sometimes we have identity theft that is a result of that. Um, often uh, our information is is made available publicly to the entire internet for for some data breach. So I think like that fundamental idea of identity is a lot different in in, in this world where we're kind of using either anonymous identity or pseudonymous identity, and uh, and it's 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 completely different, right? <laughs> yes, I, I think that this is a great uh, path to go down. Thinking about identity, thinking about um, custody, right? Custody is a good word to say. You, you, you are in control of your keys. You are in custody of your keys. And, and that's like kind of part of the ethos, the decentralized ethos of 
you know, not your keys, not your coins, right? And so that private key that controls those coins or that private key that's uh, voting in this DAP, that is your identity. And it works a little different. We, I think traditionally we think of identity as kind of top down. Someone says, what is your identity? And I'm going to set this as you and I'm going to issue you a license. And since I'm the, the higher power, me issuing that license gives it its identity. But identity in Web3 in a decentralized space is much more kind of bottom up. Your identity is technically just like what you happen to do with that private key. That private key has a narrative on chain. I bought this crypto kitty. I I bought this hash mask. I sold I sold it for twice as much. And so there, there's this artist that's like a collector and you could see their identity. So identity is like a, a weird kind of bottom up thing where, and you said pseudonymous too, like, one one of my private keys might be buying NFTs, another one might be participating in DeFi, and they may never talk to each other, but they're both me in a in a in a sense. And and then another thing that you hammered there, which is really good, is your identity follows you from platform to platform. It, since it's my keys and it's my coins, and I'm logging in and doing something in this app, I can log out of that app. And thanks to the composability, the openness, the standards, I can log into another app. No new password, no anything else. I sign a message. Here. I, I can, can even show off a, a login here. I'm going to sign in with MetaMask. And there we go. So now I'm signed in. Now I can sign a message with my key here. And it, it, it can give me this message that say, says, I'm so-and-so and I would like some ETH. I can sign that message. And that message can go to someone else and someone can recover for sure. That person that owns that private key did sign this message. And it's tamper-proof. If someone changes it, it doesn't recover the same way. So identity is very bottom up. It's very based on that private key. It's based on uh, uh, the the narrative that you create with that private key. And it gets a little scary because if you lose that private key, you lose access to that narrative. You lose access to the coins that that private key held. And so that leads to kind of this really fun thing of identity with smart contracts. And we're starting to see smart contract wallets existing as if it's your identity. Something Something like the Argent wallet or uh, what's what's another good? There's there's a lot of good smart. Uh, the Gnosis Safe, uh, both both of these basically act. It's a smart contract that acts as your identity. But if I lose my keys to my Gnosis Safe, I've got other keys that have access to it. I've got recovery methods in place. With my Argent, I have uh, guardians. I think they call it. And so if 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 my phone goes in the toilet and I lose the private key on here for my Argent wallet. I can trigger a process that's kind of like a dead man switch that will recover my account. So there's kind of this new this new identity that's showing up that's sort of like these smart contract wallets. Long, long, long uh, dive into uh, identity. Here's a fun way to show off identity to your friends. It's the punk wallet. So if you go to punkwallet.io, it's basically that private key that we're talking about in local storage. So if if I close this, it's probably gone forever. Let me let me try opening up another one. Since that was in an incognito window, I probably will not have that same punk again. Yep, I see I get a new punk. Let me close it again. I'm gonna do it. Get, let's give us another one. All right. That was that was kind of a cool punk too. There we go. Okay. So this <laughs> this is our new punk, right? And we got it just it's basically deterministically generated from your private key. It's your identity. Uh, so then let's see if I go to my punk wallet on my phone, I would I would recommend getting one on your phone. It's really nice for like having lots of test net ETH and some side chains. But if I hit scan here and I scan this guy's face, then it shows up as that icon. Right. Let me see if I can scan. Let's see. It might use my laptop camera over here. Let's see what which camera we use here. There we go. OK, so if I scan that, there we go. So that's my character. As you can see in the middle of my phone here, I kind of have this red haired COVID dude, right? And so he scanned that in. So if you're in person or you're over a Zoom call, you want to show how identity works, you want to send around some maybe testnet uh, XDAI or, or uh, some testnet ETH, uh, you can kind of just like go to Punk Wallet, have some loaded up and then scan each other. So I'm just going to send like 10 cents to this wallet and hit send. So, and this is all built with Scaffold ETH, by the way, like all the things I've built are sort of these combo moves. So all of this is open source. All of this is forkable. You can build these wallets. You can build all these other apps. Even that, that sign in with Web3 I did over there. That's just another branch of Scaffold ETH that you can fork and, and use. Woo, punk wallet. 
where where should we go next? What's yeah? The, no, what's this is next? so cool. Like, uh, I think the idea of identity following you around is really really interesting in the sense that like all these separate applications don't need to even know about each other. They don't need to know anything. All they need to know is your your private key, and that's or not your private key. Your um your yeah, um, your address. Yep. Yeah, don't let them know your private key. But like you have your address and you're kind of, you know, going around the internet and you're using it in these different apps and, and you're logging in with the same, um, the, the same identity. And uh, the interesting part is like your identity is anonymous unless you make it not anonymous, right? Unless you actually find a way to kind of tie who you are to that. It could be anonymous or it could be not anonymous. It's kind of up to you. And, and, and I, I also find that pretty interesting. But, um, you know, like uh, I'm seeing different ways that people are applying the... The, this idea of, uh, of identity that's again much different than what I'm used to and uh, what you can do if you if you think about something like an events app or something like that let's say that you have um, someone that builds out an events app and you're able to kind of authenticate with your wallet and you have your address and um, you kind of have maybe like a profile you could say start going to different events and those events also allow you to kind of sign up with your with your address you could uh, think of all of your um, transactions being stored on the blockchain somewhere. Someone could build an app that kind of shows all the different events that, that anyone's been to, regardless if those event um, applications like knew about each other because you're using that same identity. But you could also think of like different social networks being able to combine information about, um, you know, about the data that is, of course, it's public anyway, but let's say that you wanted to kind of find some new interesting way to combine data. You don't really need anyone's permission to do that because all of that data is, is available and it's public. And all you really need is kind of the address of, of whoever is like making that transaction. And as long as that is there, then the data is public and you, you can find ways to link it back together. I think I can really use a really good example there. Uh, thanks to standards and composability, POAP, is a good example. So POAPs are uh, the proof of attendance protocol. So it's it's an NFT that uh, I've been earning for years. Any any uh, Web3 event you would go to, you would get a POAP. Well, that NFT meets the standard, the 721 standard. I think it's a 721, maybe it's an 1155. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but it is a standard NFT that then I can maybe put on a, a market somewhere. But the utility there is a lot more fun. Like what if I wanted to create a decentralized chat where only people that have the PO app from ETH Denver could participate, right? And you had to sign every message with an account that owns the PO app or it wouldn't show up to the chat and, and it wouldn't read or something like that. You know, like that kind of utility can go a long ways. Looks like login with, oh yeah. And, and login with Web3, by the way, I did it. I did it here. Uh, there's, uh, can I post it? How, how do I post a link to, I guess with, if you go to scaffold ETH and type in sign, you're going to find sign in. With yeah. Web3. Sign you in you can Web3. post a link in the chat that yeah. we have here oh, no. okay. and um, it'll actually go to all the platforms. Like, like that, that I did there. I think, um, I think that one's private chat. Oh, here we oh, go. Oh yeah. There's a public chat. Let me see. Public chat. I can't get in there. Darn it. Yeah. Po um, yeah Poap is, oh, cool. Nice. Yeah, I should have been paying attention to this chat. Sorry, guys. Oh, it's all good. I'm, I've been trying to show as many of the uh, comments as possible. Word. Great, great work with StreamYard here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, StreamYard so, is dope, right? Yeah, oh, so dope. Yeah. So, yeah, so sign in with Web3. So really just like scaffold ETH is the starting point. And, and you should get started and like learn and tinker. But once you've got a feeling for the tools, you, you're ready to kind of uh, kind of level up. Hit, hit the, these branches. So like anything, let me let me just go to the branches here and sort by active and just kind of like give a, a taste of the flavor. So let's see, what do we got? Uh, Ether delivery was like a faucet I built. Uh, we have a signature-based NFT auction in the works, uh, a simple streaming system where you deploy a contract and it streams. Uh, we're looking at latest versions of hard hat. Sign in with Web3 is the latest one. Uh, Mainnet starter pack just like a nifty viewer. If you wanted to build an app that just shows all the NFTs of an account or, or something like that, the punk wallet is an, is, is right here. Oh, whoa. What did I do? Oh man. I went too far. You zoomed in a lot. Yeah. There you, you go. Have, you have zoomed in too far, sir. <laughs> Let me, uh, let's see. We go back to scaffold ETH, click branches, click active. Let me see if there's, there's, oh man, I did it wrong again. There's uh, like chain link branches. There are uh, like commit reveal, NFT auctions, uh, 
we there's like a whole like simple nft is a really good one so if you go to scaffold eth and you type in nft there's going to be a ton but there's a simple nft example that's a really great place to start if you want to learn more about building and deploying your own nfts and by the way like tangent this is the superpower of ethereum it's not open C or foundation or like one company making an NFT platform. It's you. It's like the thousands of developers out there that know how to do a Git clone and can build this and can make small changes to this contract, make small changes to the solidity, make some brand new mechanic and how royalties work with NFTs or, or somehow uh, using NFTs with DeFi, you know, like all this weird random things. I, I, I don't know why I'm stuck on NFT and DeFi too. There's, DAOs and 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 games and so many other things that are going on on Ethereum. Those are just like kind of the hot ones. But I guess long story short, Google Scaffold ETH, find these branches, get in here and start uh, just tinkering around. And I think that you'll you'll fill your blind spots up pretty quickly. So what do you uh, think about some of the uh, the next steps as far as some of the more I don't know sophisticated types of applications that are going to be built in the future, and 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 actually things that are already kind of being created out there now um, around um, decentralized protocols that offer the type of functionality that you might get from AWS for something like compute or storage, those sorts of things. So we have Filecoin that offers you know um, something like S3 you could think of, but it's in a decentralized way. You have of course the graph is what I work with is kind of like a decentralized API layer for blockchain data. But there's a bunch of other projects that are starting to come to fruition that are starting to actually become production ready. Um, to me, that's the most interesting part of this whole space, and and if it's it's enabled by smart contracts because smart contracts allow the governance of these protocols to kind of happen programmatically without any intermediary right you have you have the logic that's programmed into the contract itself that governs the protocol and participants in the nodes can basically run software that provides these different services uh, to me that's kind of like really 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 damn fascinating i i i want to like dive into that a little bit like basically going pro like let's like you've got your app let's let's say you've worked on your app You've worked on this for a while. You you kind of carve out this developer stuff. You create your own example UI. You you make this work the way you want it to, and and you're ready to go. With Scaffold ETH, you just do a yarn build and a yarn S3 or yarn surge wherever you want to put your front end. So you'll deploy your contract and then you'll deploy your app, and then that thing is just like out in the in 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 the world for people to interact with, right? So it's very easy to go live with a Scaffold ETH app just a couple of commands, but what you're going to run into, let's say, let's say you build an art platform. So this is Nifty Inc. This uses meta transactions. This uses burner wallets. This uses the sidechain uh, XDAI and it lets you build, uh, it lets you create NFTs. Oh, this is a cool one. I'm just going to let this, what's going to happen here. This is something I drew earlier, but I'm going to let it draw and I'm going to turn it into an <laughs> NFT right now for everyone. But this lets you mint an NFT on chain. And it does it so anyone can mint. I don't even know what this is. We're going to call it a uh, order book. And I'm going to mint four of them and hit ink. Let's see if this works. Nope. Uh, I need to be out of here. Okay. So the, the the thing with this is we have really good onboarding. And an artist is instantly onboarded because we generate a burner wallet for them. We use their burner wallet to sign meta transactions and we pay for the gas. And it's all on a quick and fast side chain. So over on that side chain, you're basically buying and selling the option to mint this NFT on mainnet, but it's all EVM compatible. It's all exactly like Ethereum. Uh, the problem hmm. with that instant onboarding is there's going to be tons of people making tons of art, right? Like if it's so easy for me to get in here and just say order a book, let's see if I can try it again. And four and hit ink. Let's see if I make an NFT here. There we go. So I made an NFT that fast. Now, now that's that went to IPFS. That's written on chain on Ethereum. And then there's a bridge to mainnet Ethereum if I want to go that far, but it's going to cost me like $100 to put it on mainnet. So uh, the, the graph is what I'm trying to get to. Uh, this is a very, very long-winded reason for if it's that easy for artists to get on board, we're going to have a bunch of artwork getting created on the main page. And how are we going to index this? How are we going to show this? If you wanted to land and see the latest inks uh, in a fully decentralized way, you need to go listen to the smart contract and listen for the events of when these are created. And you need to parse through all of them 
and and uh, there's just like a ton of infrastructure that goes into making something like that happen. So with Scaffold ETH, we have uh, the graph kind of built in as a middle layer once you need it. it. You you have it here and it's ready for you, but you don't hit it right away. At first, you'll just have events, right? You'll go to your contract, you'll set the purpose, you'll pay some amount, right? We'll send that in. And let's let's just send uh, ASDF two, right? So we have two of them. If I go look at the example UI, we should start to see events, right? So events come out of your smart contracts. It's like a cheap shoot. We should do we should do a quick tangent for blockchain events. So events on smart contracts are like blockchain storage, but they're not really um, they're on chain. But the gotcha is other smart contracts can't read the events from other smart contracts. So a smart contract can write an event out and everyone can read it from any of those nodes. So it's like on-chain storage that we can read, but contracts can't read it. They can't have they can't have some other contracts events as part of their logic. So if you need a contract to know about another contract and make some logical decision, you're not reading events, you're reading storage, but those events are really cheap for us because we can trigger we can fire those events off and they're way cheaper than writing something on-chain. Uh, but they're great for our front end. Mm -hmm. So each event is fired. We're parsing those. We're, it's showing up in our front end, and it gives us a nice little log. The problem is that gets to be so much. You get to have you get to the point where you have thousands of events, and if your client lands here and has to parse those in their front end every time, it's just not going to work well. So eventually, with Scaffold ETH, you're ready to upgrade to the sub the, to the graph by creating your own subgraph locally and getting all that going. It's just like one more step, and then kind of setting up the schema. So it's like here and it's ready for you when you need that middle layer to parse your events and then to be able to query from, from the graph, it's there. And, and like you said, that's like a very, it's a very important part of having the infrastructure and it's there for you in Scaffold ETH once you need it, but you kind of don't need it right, right at the start, but you need to know that like, it'll be there for you when you start to scale up. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. And um, I th so like the graph is a protocol for, you know, querying blockchain data. And it's it's a way for developers to kind of build out their own APIs as well. You just define like a schema or it's actually a manifest. And it's kind of like a, a YAML file with a few configurations. And it's it's some of the stuff that I work on uh, with with Edge and Node. But it's also part of Scaffold ETH. It's kind of, you know, um, becoming like a core part of a lot of the infrastructure. I think um, 80, I think it's actually 90% or something like that of, of a lot of the production dApps are now using it as like their API layer. But um, to me, like this is like one implementation of a decentralized protocol, which is really interesting. And it's actually, you know, successful and all that as of, you know, as of today, people are using it in production and all that. But I think like the, the fundamental underlying idea of what the graph is and the application of it across a lot of different services and ideas to me is like really, really exciting. And and it's kind of the reason I really joined this space. You know, I was, I was really in the, um, again, front end full stack cloud space for, for so long. And I think these protocols and stuff kind of opened my eyes for what is possible and maybe what is the evolution of the web in the future. Heck yeah. Awesome. <laughs> it, and and what's cool is like as the whole ecosystem builds up and we have more and more tools, there's going to be more needs for things like this. I think one key thing to get into is like the graph wants to be decentralized also, right? This this storage layer is sort of like a, it's helping you out. But I think the 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 journey for the graph is to eventually have that that query layer that I'm asking for this information, not somehow be centralized and be able to fall over, right? Going back to this web two analogy of what does it take for your servers to fall over with blockchain, it's like basically impossible. Once you deploy that, once I deploy that smart contract to that layer, not even I can stop it, right? And and, and so that level of uptime is, is kind of why you're paying for what you're paying for. And so if you have something in the middle that can fall over because of some small little bit of load, then it's kind of like, ooh, like you're, you're losing some of that decentralization. So I think that like, it's a good point to point out that like, it's not just building infrastructure, it's about building the infrastructure in a way that it stays decentralized and, uh, and won't fall over on you. 
So we got a we have a few questions, and I want to go ahead and, and go ahead and ask for more questions because we're probably going to be wrapping up here soon. So if you have a question, go ahead and shoot it over. But I'm going to go ahead and, and see if we can answer a few of these. So how did you start with this? What other resources do you recommend for learning apart from Ethan Solidity Docs? Um, you know, we talked about this a little bit. Ethan Solidity Docs are a great place to start. I would check out a lot of the stuff that um, Austin's been talking about. Ethan Build. Check out his Twitter handle. He has a few links there. Um, one of the things that I did when I first started started though was actually kind of gathered my thoughts as a new developer coming into this space and thought about how I would want these things presented to me and um, kind of created in a way that made the whole thing stick and, and kind of the light turn on for me. And I created a couple of tutorials as well that kind of go over it. And let me go ahead and, and get a link to that. But if you Google the, the complete stack, I'm sorry, the complete guide to full stack Ethereum development, that is a really great introduction, I've been told. And I think we've had over 100,000 people now um, either read this blog post or watch the video. Yeah, that's the one there. Um, any other resources that I didn't mention? Awesome. Uh, uh, that's a great, no, that's a great set. I think we talked about ethereum.org. Uh, ethereum.org is a great place to land and, and get a lot of uh, good content. And then uh, I just wanted to show off ETH build real quick. You mentioned it too, but this is a great place to get the fundamentals. I, I go through in a video very slowly talking about hash functions, key pairs, transactions, encryption, distributed ledger, the Byzantine general problem, blockchain transactions, right? And, and then eventually gets to smart contracts. And you can get in here and really kind of like tinker with stuff too. You can say, yeah, I was, I was looking at how long the length of that address was, but we can do something uh, much more interesting, right? We can bring in a key pair and kind of tinker with this. Let's let's set up a key pair and then let's bring in uh, maybe a sign and recover. And we'll even create like something that looks like a, uh, let's see, can I grab an object? There we go. So we're gonna take this object and plug that in. Oh, it needs to go to a string maybe, JSON? I don't even know. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it right now. We're, we're going to put in the two addresses, the message. It's not going to work. Okay. And then I'll have the private key to sign. And so what that looks like is you get a message uh, and a signature. We're signing the word Alice, I guess. But then that can travel across some kind of uh, insecure network, right? Anybody can read it across some network. If anybody tampers with it across that network, the signature breaks down. But on the other side, if you do everything right, the you recover the same address that signed the message right and we can kind of prove that right here in scaffold eth you can get in and maybe set up oops let me get rid of that you can get in and maybe bring in like a blockchain and see what the current block number is on mainnet right there there's the current number on mainnet and then you could even like try to set up a transaction and maybe bring in your metamask and have that kind of, oops, looks like I have to unlock it. There we go. Now I have my MetaMask address that could be a two address in a transaction and we could trigger something off. So lots of fun stuff uh, there. Ooh, proof of stake. I think- Yeah, uh, next question. Can you talk about yeah. proof of stake and what are the benefits, pitfalls? This is a great, a great uh, topic. Yep, I think, uh, so I I'm not a protocol guy. Like I have to use the, I have to throw out the disclaimer. First of all, like I'm kind of building on top of this substrate. I am not a protocol dude, so I don't know it's like some of the intricate details. I think that uh, one kind of like big picture thing, it, like coming in the future, we've got L2 coming down the line, we've got some gas EIPs, and then we've got uh, proof of stake, the, the great merge, right? I think that all of those things as a whole are going to lead to just like way more experimentation and way more just like we can we can do things for a lot less on chain now because of those. So I think that we're going to see lots of just fun, cool games, apps, anything you can think of that needs that secure layer. Like I think we're going to start seeing just like a, a a blossom of those apps coming out because it's cheaper because of the scalability. But specifically to the question, proof of stake, uh, I, I think it's going to add a little bit of complexity, right? Like we're we're going to have to kind of think of things as uh, you know, like these shards in different places and, 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 uh, think of things as a developer as like, you know, what do I have, where do I want to build in terms of, uh, what, what do I need access to? Like the composability kind of is interesting and I don't know a ton about it. So I think that we're actually getting prepared for this though, because of getting ready for scalability, we've had side chains. 
So we've had EVM compatible quick sidechains. They just weren't as secure as L1. So they didn't get as much adoption, but we've been practicing over on these sidechains for so long that when we have this environment where we're going to have multiple EVM compatible shards, and I don't know how yanking is going to work. I don't even know why they called it that, but in terms of me as a builder building on top of this protocol, I think it will get a little bit more complicated in terms of uh, maybe the signature stuff and maybe the the sharding stuff. But I think that we're already kind of prepared for it. And and as a developer, a, one EVM chain to the other, I can I can deploy one to the other just by changing an RPC address. And and I can think of the mental model there. And like you are kind of sharded off by liquidity and other things. But we'll just have to see what they build. I, I think that like it will get a little bit complicated, but I think we're already like getting practice because of all uh, these other EVM chains. That was a long-winded answer. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that's really cool. I mean, at the end of the day, also my my favorite thing about it in general is it kind of addresses the environmental concerns that that I have going into this whole space. And it was one of the reasons why I did get into this uh, at this time because I saw this actually happening. Whereas um, with proof of work, um, it's just not sustainable. So seeing that all these innovations are starting to actually come to fruition is really, really compelling to me, you know? Um, good, good question so, from Ross there. So talking about mixing Web 2 with Web 3 tech, uh, absolutely, 100%. Like, because it has been so expensive, like, these are some of the tricks that are really, really interesting, right? One one build we did uh, was, uh, I think it was off-chain voting. Let's see, see if I can, oh, man. Sure based voting. Ethereum. The the goal is like basically can can you build something? Dang it, I don't. <laughs> I definitely have a build. It's probably even in scaffold eat. Let's see. Vote. Backlog vote. Emoji vote. I think it's emoji vote. I think this is it. I think there's anyways, <laughs> yes, yes, 100 percent Try to be thinking about like minimum viable or progressive decentralization with some of these apps because a lot of the times it starts with a user. You kind of have to start with what does the user need and what is the experience the user needs and kind of work backwards for what the tech is going to have to do to handle that. And we kind of build it the other way usually where we have this cool tech and we build this cool thing on top of it and then this cool thing and then people use it and it sucks and the UX is awful and no one wants to use it, right? So you kind of have to like find the product market fit and then figure out some of like the technology stuff. So like being able to do some of this progressive decentralization where maybe there is an owner on your uh, auction contract at first. And that ownership pattern is fine at first because you maybe need to kind of, uh, you know, set some certain things up. You need to orchestrate some things, but you need to eventually decentralize that. So maybe you, you put a multi-sig as the owner for a while, and then pretty soon you deploy a DAO and that DAO is the owner of it, right? So you can do progressive decentralization. You can do tricks like having lots of caching so when your user lands on your website they get a nice beautiful view and you know if that all falls over they can still go talk to the smart contracts and it's still decentralized but you're you're using some of these web2 tricks to try to give them that web2 experience and that's really important like that's that's what keeps users around is a good experience and something useful good question that was interesting um, let's see here. We have a bunch of questions, so I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all of them. A couple of questions about the graph. Can you tell us about your work at the graph? And also was wondering if the graph index store is a part of the, of the blockchain. So I think it's a good time to kind of really talk about what these decentralized protocols are actually doing and how they allow anyone to really participate. So to me, the most interesting thing about the graph really, but also again, a lot of these other ones that are out there is that me as a developer, I don't have to go work for AWS or Google or some company and wait for them to give me that that shot to kind of get my, my foot in the door. And then I have to work for like five or 10 years and then I'm getting a salary, but I'm not actually owning into that into that money that they're making, right? I'm just an employee, which is great. And maybe they'll give you some stock, which is a way to kind of, uh, you know, get ownership. But to me, the most fundamental difference in kind of what we're doing here and what I see is happening in the future is that me as a developer, I could be living 
I don't know, maybe in Ramallah where my dad is from and uh, people are making like a few hundred dollars uh, a month on average there. I learned how to code. I see someone building something interesting. I can actually take my skill set and be a part of that and build out a piece of this infrastructure. And I can take ownership of the money that's coming in. And it's now being funneled directly from consumer to developer without the intermediary. I mean, to me, that's a big paradigm shift. Like, um, and, and, and it really is. A lot of people understand this. And that's kind of why you see a lot of this stuff starting to really take take shape. And, 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 and I think the idea was, has been there, right? A lot of people have had these ideas, but the implementation wasn't there. And you're kind of seeing the implementation continue to be uh, come to fruition. Like it's actually a real world thing that's actually happening. And it's starting to become more exciting because these things are actually working and, and people are, are building these things and they're, they're actually working as they in, were intended to work. So, you know, the, the whole idea w with the graph is um, it's, it's an application of that, right? So, um, let's kind of give a really quick overview of, of what's going on here. You have this blockchain data and, and, you know, Austin was talking about how it's very hard to query this data directly from the blockchain, especially if you're, you can, you can make a single request and request a single item. Let's say you need to get some historical information or you want to get information from a bunch of transactions. The larger the number of transactions that have happened, the longer it takes to get that data and the, and the harder it is. So for instance, um, let's say that someone launched an app two years ago and they've had a million transactions. Imagine trying to just query out of that million, those million pieces of data, like the data that you want. So what people were doing in the past to kind of get around this is they would build out their own centralized server on AWS. They would query all this data slowly and they would save it in their own database and they would expose it in an API layer. Now, for the average develop, developer, if I wanted to kind of build out uh, some, some application and I wanted to use some data from the blockchain, for me to actually go through and build that out myself was kind of a big pain in the ass, but it also really broke the idea of what decentralization is in the first place because you now are kind of moving away from blockchain and now you have this data stored on a centralized server. So people were doing that, but I think you know that's the fundamental difference is what the graph is doing. It's actually creating this protocol that allows anyone to participate in a real decentralized network of nodes. Each of these nodes can deploy their own subgraph, which is kind of an open API, an open graph QL API that you can define which which um, address or which Ethereum you know um, you know smart contract you want to build an API around. The subgraph will then crawl the blockchain and, and store all the data, all of the transactions that have happened on this server that is then going to be decentralized and, and replicated in a peer-to-peer -peer network. And you can then start querying data from this API as an API uh, consumer, as a customer almost. So you could think of like me as a customer, I would be paying API Gateway. I would be paying, you know, um, whatever, Firebase or something like that. Instead, I'm now paying this money to the protocol. The developers that are participating in that get that money. They share the money. And therefore, you kind of have now this direct economy and, and also like this ecosystem of people building and getting paid for the things that they're being built without any intermediary. Now, I think the one thing to keep in mind, though, is like as you're deploying these nodes, these nodes are typically running on something like AWS or GCP. I don't know. I might have my own server in my living room that it's running on. It could run anywhere. So it's not like these big cloud providers are going away. They're just not going to be having the control over your data as, as they might have in the past. And they're going to probably make less money, in my opinion, I guess, if these managed services are now being run by the average you know, developer. It's pretty cool with money, money at the protocol. I can make a request from the graph and pay a little bit of graph token and get that information back. And it's cool to see that, like, it feels like dog fooding at first, but it's like, wait, no, we're, we're just like, it's cause we're using this stuff cause it has utility. We're not just forcing ourselves to dog food. It, it has utility at this point and it's very important. I, one thing that you kind of hinted at there that I kind of want to tangent just a tiny bit is the fact that Ethereum is really good at, uh, kind of helping with coordination, like coordinating for humans on a, on a bigger level is, is very like, is notoriously hard for us and coordination kind of is due to trust. And so that expensive layer kind of gives us this layer where we only have to trust the code. And this is really good for helping us as humans kind of coordinate toward building bigger, better things. And so a lot of this dog fooding is actually like, how do we fund using Ethereum? How do we fund 
developers to build cool stuff on Ethereum as kind of this kind of like dog fooding cycle. And if you look at Gitcoin grants, you look at the the idea of a quadratic freelancer, you look at all the quadratic funding and the radical stuff they're doing, kind of finding and funding developers and shops that are building things that are public goods. They're not necessarily this thing is going to you know, make profit. So I'm buying into it. It's this thing is going to rise all boats. So I'm going to, I'm going to bet big on it. So they're supported and kind of, we can make all these little mechanisms and markets and ways to stream developers all on Ethereum to kind of help build more Ethereum things. But then once we prove that this works, like this, this can go to like main street. And we, we, we saw Kevin Owaki do uh Gitcoin grants in Boulder, like in a town, in a real world where they were really raising funds for things. So it's like, we're dogfooding it here, but the, the the implications are really big. Yeah. And I think a lot of these fundamental ideas overlap with well, on top of each other and, and with each other. So the idea of decentralized finance also overlaps with this decentralized web infrastructure. Uh, the idea of, of getting paid open source. And I kind of sent a tweet out earlier saying that someone should launch their next big open source project along with its own currency. And then therefore you don't have these, these open source developers creating these, these projects that are powering billion dollar companies and they're barely scraping by um, instead, let people invest in the idea and, and let that, that monetary value be matched with the actual value proposition that that software gives that is often completely way, 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 way off. It's way skewed. Babel is to me the, the biggest good example of this. You have literally trillions of dollars of software running on it and the people that are maintaining it are not making enough to, they would make more if they just went and worked at Facebook or something. To me, that just makes zero sense. The people that are creating and, and, and contributing to this should share in that money. To me, a very no-brainer way to do this is the next time you have a really big OSS project, create a currency around it, let people decide whether or not it's valuable and let them buy into it. It's going to provide incentive for innovation. It's going to provide incentive for the uh, maintenance of it. But it'll also provide a signal for people whether or not this, this project is worth maybe using, right? If it has a lot of interest and a lot of people are excited about it, maybe this is something that I need to look into Right. Maybe um, I can become an investor as well and, um, you know, and, and kind of like buy into this project, too. To me, it's a really, really cool idea. And I'm actually kind of surprised that a lot of people haven't already started doing this. It, 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 yeah, it seems like um, that just having that smart contract uh, settlement layer and then having streaming funds and having hooking it up to GitHub. There's there's so many like weird ways you can take that. But it just seems like. I'm imagining that Nifty Inc. runs on these 15 different open source things. And if someone were to buy something in Nifty Inc., we could code it in there, not just artist royalties, but we could pay royalties to like React Canvas server and stuff, the, the little drawing component that we used, right? That was just an open source thing we took off the shelf and made into a drawing platform. But the two original developers there who probably all have their own you know, set of dependencies, like if the money could trickle down to all of those, like that's that's definitely like a, a an overall vision that seems very doable with this technology. But you're right, there's there's not a ton of it. I, I think Gitcoin is probably the most ahead in this area, but there's a lot of other people thinking about funding public goods and funding developers and finding mechanisms that work on Ethereum that kind of like work on their own that actually like really surface these great developers and get them paid. Yeah, so Gitcoin, you can go to Gitcoin now and actually see a bunch of bounties for people that um, have you know, any coding experience. You can jump in and kind of claim a bounty by working on something and getting paid in cryptocurrency for it. Pretty cool idea for sure. And it seems to be kind of a really interesting application of some of the stuff that we're talking about. But um, but 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 it's different though, like than what I expected when I start looking into it. It's really cool and all of that, and I'm sure it's going to continue to to maybe get better. But I think the one thing that I noticed was that a lot of the things that I thought would just be, okay, make this money to, to fix this open source thing or to contribute to this thing have now, there's a few people now posting like actual like projects in there, like build this thing, almost like, um, you know, Upwork or something. And I'm not a huge fan of that being merged into that. It seems like two separate things almost. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Let's make the other thing. <laughs> like it's, it's yeah. more like Git Gitcoin has so many eyes on it that you're able to maybe launch something you can, you can with, without having your own community, you can 
put something up there and have a community look at it. I think that there's there's just a lot of those happening. I'm doing the same thing. I have something called the Build Guild, which is uh, basically a guild of builders building on Scaffold ETH. And, and it's just like, we have this North Star of, are you building something that's helpful to the ecosystem? If you build something cool, so you saw all those branches in there, most of them aren't built by me. If you go find something you want to learn, like commit reveal or chain link VRF or any of that, and there's not a good tutorial, go go learn it, go build it with Scaffold ETH, and then turn the tutorial into something that kind of explains how to go through and learn that. And I'll start streaming ETH to you. And I'm doing this to like a, to a bunch of developers. Like if if you're on with if you're if you're mission aligned, I'm gonna use a thought thought leader word there. If you're mission aligned and you're helping me build generic awesome components for scaffold ETH for the ecosystem, then I'm gonna start streaming ETH to you. And that's something that I can do by just deploying a contract. So it's like there's tons of these little skunk works things popping up all over the ecosystem. It's not about the one open sea. It's about the thousand developers down the tail that are doing weird things. And, and that's uh, probably like where I'm most excited about developer funding and how, how that's going. Also, Gitcoin is just doing a great job, too. So they're leading the front, but there's lots of us weirdos kind of experimenting along the way, too. Well, I think this is a really cool discussion. It might be a good stopping point. So um, is there anything that you wanted to finish off with after, you know, all of this really deep dive that we've had? Uh, just, yeah, I, I think ethereum.org is great. You've got a great starter kit, uh, ETH build to get fundamentals, build something with Scaffold ETH, reach out to me if you're stuck on something, but you should be able to just go to Scaffold ETH, find a branch that you like, fork it and build a product. Like it should be, that's what it should be like. <laughs> if, if you're just getting in, you're a web two developer, get into Scaffold ETH and tinker with Solidity, get the feeling for it and then grab a branch and reach Yeah, out I think that's here. the thing that I miss when I was looking at it. And I'm just learning about just now, actually, that there are different branches and they all have different projects, essentially, that do their own thing. When I first looked at it, I thought it was just one thing. So now that, that that's pretty cool to know. We need to do a better job of showing it off. I'll, I'll do a better job of showing those branches here pretty soon. Like as we launch the next round of the Build Guild, it'll be more obvious. So that, that's good feedback for me. Awesome. Well, um, it was really cool to talk to you. Thank you for for joining me today. And thank you for your time. And I, lo I love your energy, man. I just really like that. I thought I had a lot of energy, but nowhere near as much energy as you. So uh, <laughs> it was, it's, it's been really cool. Team. Let's do this again sometime. For sure. Thank you and, for having me. And, yeah. And thanks for everyone on Twitter. Uh, thanks for everyone on YouTube and, and Twitch uh, tuning in. I think we hit like 120 concurrent viewers at the top. That was pretty, pretty good. So I'm happy that uh, we were able to kind of put this on today. Hope everyone has a great weekend and we'll see you around.